Hey everybody, um, we are going to get started with Rogue Wave. Um, we are going to read the first half of the story. Um, I'm going to read the first half to you and you are going to um, have certain times during the video that you're going to pause the video and you're going to answer some of these um, signposts um, over to the side and some questions that they have for you to kind of help you think a little bit deep, um, more deeply about the text that we're reading. Um, so I am on page seven of your student workbooks. If you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at. I've got it in front of me. Um, but I also have it displayed on the screen. That way you can kind of see um, where I am. So you can, I would prefer that you follow along in your book. Um, but if that is not an option, you can follow along on your screen and write your answers on a separate sheet of paper. Um, it's going to be a lot easier though if you do your book. All right, so let's get started with some background. So this is an adventure story um, that features a cutter-rigged sailboat. Now, I know nothing about sailboats, so I'm learning right here along with you. Um, cutter-rigged boats are small sailing yachts, each with a single mast for the main sail and smaller sails up front. So um, you know how ships have those tall poles? So this kind of boat only has one of those. Um, typically we see like pirate ships and they have three or four. So this is a smaller boat. It only has one of those poles. Um, so it says cutters can be equipped with a cabin that usually includes a small kitchen called a galley. Um, author Theodore Taylor wrote many stories about self-reliant characters who face great challenges. His best known book, The K, depicts the struggles and revelations of a boy shipwrecked during World War II. I've heard of that book, but I've never read it, so... All right, let's get started with Rogue Wave, a short story by Theodore Taylor. Setting a purpose. Pay attention to the details and events that make this story an adventure. As you read, think about the setting and how the author builds excitement and anticipation throughout the short story. So the author is going to use details and the setting to kind of build suspense and to make us more interested in this story. And our goal is to figure out where those moments happen. And we're going to do that through our signposts over here to the side. All right, so let's get started. A killer wave known to mariners as a rogue wave was approaching a desolate area of Baja, California, below Ensenada. It had been born off the east coast of Australia during a violent storm. It had traveled almost 7,000 miles at a speed of 20.83 miles an hour. Driven by an unusual pattern of easterly winds, it was a little over 800 feet in length and measured about 48 feet from the bottom of its trough to its crest. On its passage across the Pacific, it had already killed 13 people, mostly fishermen in small boats, but also an entire French family of five aboard a 48-foot schooner. So pause your video here. Go ahead and do your part over here for making inferences. So annotate in paragraph one, more details that describe rogue waves and interpret. What do these details suggest about the conflict of this story? You can underline right here in the paragraph and you can write your answer right down here on the bottom of the screen. All right, so one of the things that I, um, I marked off as um, details that describe rogue waves were um, how fast it was traveling, so 20.83 miles an hour, um, an unusual pattern of easterly winds. So this is not something that happens all the time because it has to have an unusual pattern of winds to happen. Um, I also underlined 800 feet in length and 48 feet from bottom to crest. So that means it's 48 feet tall from the very bottom of it where it meets the ocean to the very top of it where it's like, you know, curving down as a wave. Okay, so those are some of the things that I underlined. Um, and I hope yours were similar. All right, so paragraph two, ooh, scroll too far. Melissa Scoot Aikens went below into the old sea dog's tiny galley moving down the three steps of the companionway, closing the two solid entry doors behind her. Always a good idea in offshore sailing. The three horizontal, ha horizontal hatch boards that were on top of the doors were also firmly in place, securing the 34 Baba type against sudden invasion of seawater. So we have a character, Melissa or Scoot, 
And she has gone into the um, living quarters, the kitchen area of this boat. And she's closed off all the doors, which our paragraph tells us is smart in case um, water comes in. They're, the doors are watertight. So she's going to be protected from that. All right, so moving on to paragraph three. Rogues and sneakers have been around since the beginning of the oceans, and the earliest sea literature makes note of, a, of giant waves. The U.S. Navy Manual Practical Methods for Observing and Forecasting Ocean Waves says, in any wave system, after a long enough time, an exceptional high one will occur. These monstrous outsized waves are improbable, but still possible, and the exact time of occurrence can never be predicted. Naval hyd hydro hydrography, that's a hard word to say, <laughs> studies indicate that waves 15 to 25 feet high qualify for sneaker or sleeper status. The freak rogue is up to 100 feet or over. As waters slowly warm, they seem to be occurring more frequently. In 1995, the Queen Elizabeth II, the great British passenger liner, encountered a 95-foot rogue south of Newf Newfoundland. More than 900 feet long, the QE2 rode over it, but her captain said it looked like they were sailing into the white cliffs of Dover. All right, let's keep moving. Um, so that was just giving us a little bit of information um, about the history of rogue waves. And it seems to me, I'm kind of inferring, I'm kind of taking from context clues, because this is, um, most of it is italicized, it kind of makes me think that our character is reading that from somewhere. Like maybe she has a magazine or a book um, that she's reading that out of. Sullivan Atkins, Scoot's oldest brother, was steering the cutter-rigged boat on a northerly course about 15 miles off desolate Cabo Calnet, south of Ensenada. Under a brilliant sun, the glittering blue Pacific rose and fell in long, slick swells. That means a long, unbroken wave. A cold, light breeze holding steady. So the... The weather seems to be, you know, fairly decent. Um, there's long swells, so there's long waves. They're not really short, you know. Um, so let's go ahead and hop over to this analyze plot. So annotate in paragraphs two and four, circle the names of the main characters. I've kind of given you a hint. Um, and underline details that describe where each person is on the boat. Okay, so underline those places and then predict. Why might it be important to the plot that these characters are in two different settings? So why are they in two different places? Why is that important? So go ahead and pause the video. All right, so our first character is this Scoot Atkins. And she is in, let me scroll where you can see. She is in the galley, so the kitchen area. And she's behind all those doors. Remember, we talked about those doors. So she's behind all those doors in the galley area, okay? Then her brother, Sullivan, he's steering the boat. So he's outside. He's at the wheel. He's steering. Um, so they're in two very different places. He's kind of out on the deck. She's kind of inside um, in the kitchen area. And I think that's important. So over here in this predict, I think that's important because this is an adventure story, but they're not together. So I think that something is going to happen that's going to cause them to be even more separated. So they're not together on the boat right now, and I think something's going to happen, and they're going to be even more separated than they are now. Okay? So let's move on to paragraph five. Below deck, Scoot was listening to Big Sandy and his fly ride boys singing Swingin' West and singing along with them while slicing leftover steak from last night's meal. They'd grilled it on a small charcoal ring that was mounted outboard on the starboard side at the stern. So um, they've got it kind of to the right of the boat. If you'll read down here in your footnote, it says outboard on the starboard side. So positioned outside, so it's outside of the boat but it's on the right side of the boat. So they got something kind of hanging over there that they can grill with. Um, the sea dog had every blessed thing, including a barbecue pit, she marveled. 
So she's really excited that um, this is kind of a nice boat. It has a lot of uh, bells and whistles, if you will. All right, paragraph six. Scoot was learning how to be a deep water sailor. She was 14 years old and pretty with dark hair. Though small in size, not even five feet, she was strong. She'd started off with eight foot sabots. On this trip, her first aboard the Sea Dog, she'd manned the wheel for most of the three days they'd been underway. She'd stood four hour watches that night. Sully was a good teacher. So Scoot, we've learned, is 14. Her brother is older than her. We don't know how much. Um, but she's learning how to sail out in deep water. Um, and her brother is the one that's teaching her. And we also have learned that they've been out for three days. So they've been on this boat for three days sailing. All right, paragraph seven. It was one of those perfect days to be out, Sully thought. The three Dacron sails belayed and whispering, white bow waves singing pleasant songs as the fiberglass hull tilting to starboard sliced through the ocean. It was a day filled with goodness, peace, and beauty. They'd come south as far as Cabo Calnet, turning back north only an hour ago. They'd sailed away from Catalina Island's Avalon Harbor, the Sea Dog's home port, out in the channel of Los Angeles. Sully had borrowed the boat from a family friend, Bo Tucker, a stockbroker with enough money to outfit it and maintain it properly. Built by Ta Xing of Taiwan, she was heavy and sturdy, with a teak wood deck and handsome teak wood interior and the latest in navigation equipment. Sully had sailed her at least a dozen times. He'd been around boats, motor, and sail for many of his 19 years. He thought the old sea dog was the best in her category that he'd ever piloted. So again, this boat is super nice. It has all the bells and whistles. It's got the best navigation equipment. Navigation is like GPS, like how you get around and how you find your way. Um, and Sully is 19. We see right here that he's 19 years old. And he's sailed this boat quite a few times. So this seems to be, this Bo Tucker seems to be a family friend who has a lot of money and a nice boat. And so they, they often borrow it to go out and sail and do that kind of thing. Um, so that's what they're doing now. And like we said, they've been out for three days. All right. So paragraph eight. As he was about to complete a northeast tack, Sully's attention was drawn to a squadron of seagulls diving on small fish about 100 yards off the port bow. And he did not see the giant wave that had crept up silently behind the sea dog. But a split second before it lifted the boat like a carpenter's chip, he sensed something behind him and glanced backward toward the towering wall of shining water. It was already too late to shout a warning to Scoot so she could escape from the cabin. Too late to do anything except hang on to the wheel with both hands. Too late even to pray. He did manage a yell as the sea dog became vertical. She rose up the surface of the wall, stern first, and then pitched violently, end over end, the bow submerging and the boat going upside down taking Sully and Scoot with it, the 40-foot mast, sails intact, now pointing toward the bottom. So, over here to the side, you have again and again. So, notice and note. Mark words that are repeated in paragraph 9. So, what words are repeated here in paragraph 9? And then predict. Why might the author have chosen to repeat these words? And how do you think this repetition adds suspense to the rising action of the story? So how is this making us feel like we're sitting on the edge of our seat and we have to know what's, what's going to happen next? So you can um, underline right here in the paragraph and write your answers down here at the bottom of the screen. So go ahead and pause and do that. All right, thank you. Um, so the words that I marked up in paragraph nine were too late, too late, too late. So in my opinion, that is being repeated several times. And the author is doing that um, to try to make us understand that this is all of a sudden um, and it's too late for them to prepare in any way. They don't have time to do anything before this wave is upon them. And let's see, how do you think this repetition adds suspense? I think it makes us understand that this is instant, like 
as soon as he sees the wave, it's right there and there's nothing they can do. And we have this, this feeling of dread, like, oh my gosh, you know, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? Because they don't have any time to prepare. All right, moving on to paragraph 10. Scoot was hurled upward, legs and arms flying, her head striking the after galley bulkhead, and then the companionway steps and the interior deck, which was now the ceiling. She instantly blacked out. So as this boat's turning, she's getting shook all around, and um, she ends up passing out because she hits her head so much. Everything loose in the cabin was scattered around what had been, what had been the overhead. Water was pouring in and was soon lapping at Scoot's chin. It was coming from a four-inch porthole that had not been dogged securely and a few other smaller points of entry. So over here to the side, we see a porthole is a circular window in a boat or ship. I'm sure that you've seen those before on a TV show. Um, they're the kind of windows that SpongeBob has in his house. He has portholes. Um, so I'm sure we've all seen those before. All right, so let's keep reading. Sully's feet were caught under four stay sailcloth, plastered around his face, and the, excuse me, but then he managed to shove clear and swim upward, breaking water. He looked at the mound of upside-down hull, bottom to the sky, unable to believe that the fine, sturdy sea dog had been flipped like a cork, perhaps trapping Scoot inside. Treading water, trying to collect his thoughts, he yelled, Scoot! But there was no answer. Heart pounding. Unable to see over the mound of the hull, he circled it, thinking she might have been thrown clear. But there was no sign of her. He swam back to the point of cabin entry, took several deep breaths, and dove. He felt along the hatchboards and then opened his eyes briefly to see that the doors were still closed. She was still inside. Maneuvering his body, he pulled on the handles. The doors were jammed, and he returned to the surface for air. So Sully is outside the ship. Scoot is inside, not a ship, boat. Um, and he's kind of wrapped up in stuff and he gets himself free and he goes up and he gets some air and he's like, oh my gosh, I've, you know, I've got to find my sister. So he goes back down and he's looking and the door is still closed. So he knows that she's still in the galley, the kitchen area. Um, so this part over here, we got to read two more paragraphs and then we'll come back to it. So don't worry, I haven't forgotten. All right, so paragraph 14. He knew, by the way, the boat had already settled that there was water inside her. Under, un under usual circumstances, excuse me, the hull being upright, there would be four feet, nine inches of hull below the water line. There would be about the same to the cabin overhead, enabling a six-foot person to walk about down there. Panting, blowing, Sully figured there was at least three, a three-foot air pocket holding the sea dog on the surface and if Scoot hadn't been knocked unconscious and drowned, she could live for quite a while in the dark chamber. How long, he didn't know. So he's able to figure out that there probably is still air in there, and she's probably okay um, if she hasn't already drowned from being knocked out. Um, but he doesn't know how much air there is and how long she can stay in there. Um, so you can imagine he's very anxious to get to her and make sure she's okay. All right, so back up here um, on page 10, we're going to do the analyzed plot. So in paragraphs 9 through 15, mark the details that describe the conflict. So go through and underline things where problems are popping up. And then predict, based on other short stories you've read, how do you think the characters are going to respond to this conflict? Um, and you can go back and look at the genre characteristics on page 5. So go ahead and pause the video and get that taken care of. Thank you. So some of the things um, in paragraphs 9 through 15 that I underlined, um, and we got to go back here, um, kind of this whole part about the too late, too late, too late, um, I kept those underlined for this because that's letting us know, oh my gosh, there's getting ready to be a problem. In paragraph 10, um, I underlined Scoot was hurled upward um, because she's just kind of being flown all around um, the cabin. She, she's falling all over the place. Um, so I put water was pouring in in paragraph 11. Um, then down here, let's see, what did I mark? 
um, managed to shove clear and swim upward, breaking water. So he was kind of trapped underwater in the sail and things, um, and he was able to get up. So I marked that. Um, let's see. Doors were jammed, and she was still inside is what I marked for paragraph 13. Mainly, she was still inside. For paragraph 14, I marked um, there was water inside her because he knows there's water going in the boat. And for paragraph 15, I marked, um, let's see, she could live for quite a while in the dark chamber. So he knows that she'll be okay for a little while, but he doesn't know how long. Okay, so back up here at the top, predict. So how are these characters going to respond to this based on some of the other short stories that you've read? Um, I think, that they're going to fight to survive just based on some of the other things that I've read. Typically, that's what people do. You know, they're in this difficult situation and they do everything they can to get themselves out of it. So I think that's what these two are going to do. I think um, that Sully is going to keep diving and trying to find his sister. And I think she's going to eventually maybe wake up um, and try to find her brother. So I think they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that they both survive. All right, so let's move on. Paragraph 16. You have to excuse me. I'm going back and forth from the computer to the, the student textbook. It's a little bit confusing, and I know I'm looking all crazy, but it's okay. All right, paragraph 16. In the blackness, water continued to lap at Scoot's chin. She had settled against what had been the deck of the galley alcove, her body in an upright position on debris. Everything not tied down or in a locker was now between the overhead ribs. Wooden hatch covers from the bilges were floating in the water, and the naked bilges were exposed. Just aft of her body, and now above it, was the small diesel engine as well as the batteries. Under the water were cans of oil, one of them leaking. Battery acid might leak, too. Few sailors could imagine the nightmare that existed inside the sea dog. Scoot's pretty face was splashed with engine oil. So she's kind of sitting up um, and things are all around her. Things are just thrown all about and she has oil on her face. Um, so she's kind of dirty from where things have kind of flown all over. All right, so paragraph 17. Over the next five or six minutes, Sully dove repeatedly using his feet as a fulcrum. Um, I don't think that's a vocab word, but he's using his feet to kind of get himself up and down. So he's pushing off the boat and then going back and kind of kicking his way down um, and using all the strength that he had in his arms, legs, and back in an effort to open the doors. The pressure of the water defeated him. Then he thought about, we'll finish this paragraph, then we'll come back, trying to pry the doors open with the wooden handle of the scrub brush. Too late for that, he immediately discovered. It had drifted away, along with Scoot's nylon jacket, her canvas boat shoes, anything that could float. So he thinks of all these things that could help him, but they've all kind of floated away since this rogue wave um, has flipped their boat over. So let's go back up to page 11. And we'll do here this again and again. So notice a note. So mark the action that is repeated in paragraph 17 and explain why Sully does something over and over. So why is he doing that over and over? And then infer, how does this add to the story's suspense? So pause the video, go ahead and take care of that. All right, so for the notice and note, what I noticed was that Sully is diving repeatedly. So he's going down and trying to get the doors open and coming back up for air, and then he's going right back down. Uh, and he's doing that to try to get to his sister and save his sister. Um, and I think that adds suspense because he keeps doing it over and over. And us, as the reader, we don't know what's going to happen next. So we're wondering what's going on with Scoot during all this. Um, is he going to be able to get to her? Is he going to be able to rescue her? Um, so it's really keeping us on the edge of our seat. We want to know what's going to happen next. All right, so paragraph 18. Finally, he climbed on top of the keel, catching his breath resting a moment, trying desperately to think of a way to enter the hull. Boats of the Baba class, built for deep water sailing, quite capable of reaching Honolulu and beyond, were almost sea tight unless the sailors made a mistake or unless the sea became angry. 
The side ports were supposed to be dogged securely in open ocean. Aside from the cabin doors, there was no entry into that cabin without tools. He couldn't very well claw a hole through the inch of tough fiberglass. So he's saying he can't get through the bottom of the boat um, without having some help, um, some tools to help him. He thought about the hatch on the foredeck, but it could only be opened from inside the cabin. There was the skylight on the top of the 17-foot cabin, used for ventilation as well as a sun source. But, excuse me, that butterfly window, hinged in the middle, could be opened only from the inside. Even with scuba gear, he couldn't, get, he couldn't open that skylight unless he had tools. So he's thinking of several different ways that he can get in, but he can't get in without anything to help him, and he doesn't have anything like that. Paragraph 20, he fought back tears of frustration. There was no way to reach Scoot. And he knew what would happen down there. The water would slowly and inevitably rise until the air pocket was only six inches. Her head would be trapped between the surface of the water and the dirty bilge. The water would torture her. Then it would drown her. Seawater has no heart, no brain. The sea dog would then drop to the ocean floor, thousands of feet down, entombing her forever. So he knows what's going to happen if he can't get to her. Maybe the best hope for poor Scoot was that she was already dead, but he had to determine whether she was still alive. He began pounding on the hull of the bottom of, with the bottom of his fist, waiting for a return knock. At the same time, he shouted her name over and over. Nothing but silence from inside there. He wished he'd hung on to the silly scrub brush. The wooden handle would make more noise than the flesh of his fist. Almost half an hour passed, and he finally broke down and sobbed. His right fist was bloody from the constant pounding. Why hadn't he gone below to make the stupid sandwiches? Scoot would have been at the wheel when the wave grasped the sea dog. His young sister, with all her life to live, would be alive now. All right, so we're going to pause here. We're going to do language conventions. So writers use a mix of sentence types to convey ideas. So read the first two sentences in paragraph 22 and mark the simple sentence and circle the compound sentence. So a simple sentence is just one little sentence, no commas, no, no separate clauses, and the compound sentence is kind of a longer sentence and it's more complicated. Um... And then summarize, explain how you were able to identify which sentence was simple and which was compound. So I just gave you a hint there. Let's go ahead and get that done. All right, so our simple sentence is the second one. His right fist was bloody from the constant pounding. That's just one thought, um, and it's one sentence. Um, however, this complex, or excuse me, compound sentence, um, is kind of like a sentence and a half put together. Um, so we can say he finally broke down and sobbed, and that's one whole sentence. And then this first part, after almost half an hour passed, that's kind of like half a sentence. So we kind of put it with the other sentence, and that makes it a compound sentence. And we'll get more into that later as we, as we learn more. All right. So we're going to read the, quickly read the last three paragraphs that we're going to go over today. Um, and then do this last memory moment. So paragraph 23. They'd had a good brother-sister relationship. He teased her a lot about being pint-sized, and she'd tease back, holding her nose when he brought one girl or another home for display. She'd always been spunky. He'd taken her sailing locally in the channel, but she'd wanted an offshore cruise for her 14th birthday. Now she'd had one, unfortunately. Their father had nicknamed her Scoot because as a baby she'd crawled so fast. It was still a fitting name for her as a teenager. With a wiry body, she was fast in tennis and swimming and already the school's champion in the 100-yard dash. Eyes closed, teeth clenched. He kept pounding away with the, bloody, with the bloody fist. Finally, he went back into the ocean to try once more to open the doors. He sucked air, taking a half dozen deep breaths and then dove again. Bracing his feet against the companionway frames, he felt every muscle straining but the doors remained jammed. He was also now aware that if they, were di if they did open, more water would rush in and he might not have time to find Scoot in the blackness and pull her out. But he was willing to make the gamble. So go ahead and um, let's take care of this memory moment. So in paragraphs 23 and 24, underline memories Sully has about Scoot. 
And then what do those memories suggest about how Sully is feeling um, about her chances of escape? All right, so it says they had a good brother and sister relationship. They teased each other, um, and he tells that she was really fast and she's really good at sports. Um, and so that kind of makes us think that he's feeling really nervous and apprehensive and worried about her. 